Hi, Dan and Starfish Troopers is going to join us, or Strayfish Troopers. <laughs> So I guess, um, you know, from my point of view, uh, whilst other people are waiting to come into the room, um, it's kind of where to focus at right now moving forward. Uh, because, um, well, <laughs> we've got so many directions we can go in. And uh, there's this huge wealth of work that probably needs to be captured and shared. So, um, Obviously, as you know, one of my big focuses in the short term is to do the Mr. Possible book and the Hutchinson effect and to make sure that whilst John is alive, a faithful short biography and um, some extremely good quality images of his best samples and potential uh, uh, you know, explanation can be incorporated into a working document so that is one thing there is a huge amount of improvement that we can make to dr taka akimatsumoto's book and from the videos we can improve the imagery in there where they are black and white and sometimes barely perceptible to being in color and much much higher fidelity and what i didn't say and i meant to say in the stream just now is that uh, Dr. Takaki Matsumoto has reached out to me and he's trying to work with his daughter to share parameters and specifics of his experiment that aren't in his book so people can re replicate them. So uh, he's been really inspired by what's happened over the last couple of weeks. And so um, if, we, if we can make like much more detailed you know how to's for some of his um experiments combine that with the the videos of the original experiments um then i think that the chances of accurate replication are going to be much much higher so I, I don't know if anyone's got anything to say on um what we're talking about there there's a lot of things to share on the windhex um coming up um, different people are trying different things um, I know that uh, Hank has made a miniature uh, Windhex uh, exploration device uh, using a one of these kind of like sucker blower domestic units and and some buckets and things like that in the classic Hank uh, fast cycling experiments uh, uh, way. So you know maybe we can. I think we're already learning something from that. So that needs to be shared. So expect probably this week another update on the Windex progress. Our trip to Holland uh, revealed several things, and it is my understanding that a much better side channel blower has been bought. New inputs are going to be um, fashioned such that the higher flow rate of air can be injected. This will be at a high temperature. It will have a air distribution donut. Uh, like one of the devices we saw from China, and uh, also uh, later down the line, it ways to maybe add temperature to it. So there's lots of interesting things going on there. Um, and so, you know, it's 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 where 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 should we uh, focus uh, time move, moving forward? Uh, I know there's a lot to share from people from several countries. Um, on the bagel experiments. Um, so some really interesting work is being done uh, on those, uh, some in an anti-gravity sense and some, some in a kind of plasma control sense. And so there's a whole package of information to share from various authors on that. And the work that Hink's done actually in simulating the, the fundamentals of potentially creating a, a um, sacred geometry plasma structure he already knew from experiments done in vega already 
that Plasma likes to hide, as he calls it. It likes to be under a crack somewhere. And so the experiments that I've started to share, and I've got some beautiful high-speed video and some high bit depth imagery to share um, from the trip um, last week. Uh, he had the dome as an iron dome, and then he drilled a number of holes semi-equidistant around it to kind of simulate some sort of exchange under the dome like goes on in the wind hex. And then, you know, what to put in? I said, well, if you've got hydrogen, let's have hydrogen in there because it can create this etheric matter and then have the aluminium in there because it seems to be one of the things that Tesla used. And it was also the most affected material from John Hutchison. So that's what he put in there. We tried a bit and then we tried a stack, as you see in the videos which we've shared. And then, then he came up with this idea of putting crumpled things in there. And it's completely counterintuitive. If you think you've got an electrode, which is the cathode, and it's got a big cylinder, the idea that some plasma is eating holes out and, or through the center of a, inside a solid cathode it's a bit weird to think why is it doing that why is it not just discharging between the top of the dome and the anode and it, it's it's just what what he did by accident in the original vega valley experiment he had this huge old water steel water drum which it was his basic attempt at trying to do something sapphireish and because it had a small hole in the top he had to cut up sheets of brass into strips and then and, and also pieces of metal and put two bits of angle iron down to produce, a, you know, a, a, a flat area. Then he had to put brass across and then he had to put brass across to build up a, you know, a platform on which he could put his test subjects. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and it, it is, to my knowledge, the first time and it's by accident um. It's, the, to my, my knowledge, the first time where a serious amount of experiments were done with a layered cathode, because quite rightly, rightly under, people's understanding of electrical discharge is between the, the nearest thing and the nearest thing, <laughs> right? And, and almost, I mean, you look at the Sapphire original experiment, it's basically a huge, great flat plate. If you look at the Lafferty book, in 1980, going all the way back to all the Bell Labs experiments, all the way back to the 1930s, they're always one shape of an electrode and another shape of an electrode, right? They're not a layered electrode and a gap in between one of the layers, which formed the Vega Valley. And this is when he learned that, you know, something, ball lightning falls in the, forms in the crack, and then it flows under the crack. So like, what is flowing? how is something flowing in between two electrodes so it's it's totally surreal but this this actual dome experiment is almost more surreal because it's it's actually in that whole cylinder it's actually interacting in the aluminium the aluminum that's inside this iron cylinder why <laughs> why what is going on something is going through that and you know because he wanted to see it he then swatched switched the solid cylinder out for and um a you know a steel mesh and it seems to do the same thing <laughs> so um i actually have a sample in here okay which i will do a more analysis of maybe i'll maybe i'll get it out but the interesting thing about this sample is and henk noticed it it's not something i've noticed but i i will look at it in more detail is on one side it's got like a burnt area and then over the other side on this kind of like north south line it has another area it's not burnt but it is black it's like coat it's aluminium that's coated in a thin layer of something that's black uh, and it's only in that spot but it's not chewed away and it's not eaten up like the other side so the, i think there's a huge amount that can be learned from this experiment um and so, yeah, it's it's totally fascinating. So, has anyone first got any questions on ego out? And has anyone got like you know, with all of the threads that are going on, are there ways that people think they can suggest uh, people can uh, support the project uh, in terms of intellectually or whatever, um, doing experiments? And and 
and what what should you know maybe I be focusing on moving forward and 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 how how we can coordinate best. So has anyone got any anyone put their hand up first? <laughs> Gordon, you're, you're you're a good aggregator here. So uh, do you have any comments on first ego out? Well, not so much. I, I, I've been thinking um, about what uh, Hank has, has demonstrated with the aluminium being eaten on one side and, as you say, black stuff appearing on the other. It reminds me very much of the uh, of the uh, jewelry cleaner, uh, Ultra. And mm -hmm. I was thinking, yeah, if you if you want a recipe, that that you definitely need cavities where you can create some sort of resonance. That's important. You need something that can provide material definitely uh because it obviously eats material from somewhere that, that does something with it and need electrons i think mm -hmm. it needs a lot of electrons mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's it's things that are, uh basically what you want to do is try try to create some sort of vortical and then the ele electrons be and matter is being pulled into it and it can't all occupy the same space in the middle so it's going to start circulating and that's what you need you need the circulating and pulling more and more stuff in with the electrons coming in as a, forming a sheath around the outside. That's what's going to start eventually when it sinks deep enough in the uh, fractal toroidal structure. That's what's going to start creating your EVO. So I think that's very important. I think that's the most important avenue to pursue. Uh, I mean, yes, the uh, the tornado is, is is interesting because that's that's a big structure. But I don't think... It, unless you get a really very powerful tornado you won't quite reach that level um but having said that if you could feed it material and electrons it needs electrons otherwise it's yeah, not so that, that is that is what we are missing currently in the the, the 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 we don't have particularly any way to do the ionization at the moment in the system so it's it's baby steps so if you go to windhex.com you can see some google spreadsheets uh, where the plan for the experiment is progressing. And you can see some analysis from the uh, um, very extensive book online of, of how tornadoes thought to work by that author. I can't remember his name immediately. Um, but the, you know, at the moment, we, we, the, the test that we did Friday a week ago, um, it was with an air compressor that gave us about 56 seconds or so of runtime and probably not all of that at peak speed. And what we found in all of these systems is nothing happens until it gets past the threshold and then everything happens. Secondly, because the air temperature on the day was 20 degrees and it comes out of a compressor, you'll be lucky if that air is at 15 degrees. Now, if you're going to get any kind of really sensible thing going on, according to the Windex kind of design, you need to be over 100 degrees, and we're not anywhere close to that. Then we've got no moisture in there. It's basically dry air out of there, so you're not getting any a charge separation going on there, and so on. But by doing what, what was done, we were able to learn about the vortical flow with the system as it is. And what Henk has done with his basic... Uh, design using a blower over the last day or two is he's shown that if you if you have it straight you get stuff coming down the bottom and coming out the top equally it's just like blowing it into a bag with two holes right but if you angle them like this you then start getting things being drawn in from the bottom and thrown out the top so the actual the angle of the ports is very very important and then it comes to the sound he hasn't got any whistling going on on his we at least have probably got some whistling going on in the wind hex of Tony Giboni. So, you know, um, uh, so the, the next process is the, these devices, these um, blowers have been bought, two blowers, and they should provide 10 times the cubic uh, uh, foot per uh, minute of air. And so we already saw things moving around quite quickly, right? Times that by 10. And then the problem is, it do, is it able to provide the pressure to keep it for, forcing the air in there so this this is able this device is able to do a, a couple of i think it's 0.15 of a bar over atmospheric pressure so it has got the ability to put some positive pressure in there the device i wanted to do use was able to provide the same kind of volume of air per minute but was additionally able to provide up to nine and a half like the same as the shop compressor if you look at a tornado, as they travel from the sea over the land, they die. So right. they definitely need the moisture. They absolutely need that moisture to be, to be driven. And they've also got very, very sharp wind shear. 
that's that's well documented that they cross over this uh, line and it's really quiet in the middle. Uh, a plane's yeah. flying through it, really silent. Well, like that, that then, picture that's in that book is is or yeah. the online book is incredible because you have that Noah in whenever it was 1960s or 70s they threw flares on buoys down and you can see that the flare is coming directly out and and um that shows there's basically no wind speed that's re relative to the water spout at that point okay so the way i look at this and i described this when i was in uh, and i'm going to do a much more detailed thing i do believe the toroidal moment is able to interact with with relic neutrino dark matter and they have a weak interaction with electrons and so that you have various stages of this process at the at the, the lowest level you have things that change the relationship of electrons with other matter so when you are looking at friction what are you looking at friction you're looking at the electrons interacting between one bit of matter and the other so if you can remove the that will build up static electricity of course yeah uh, of course yeah. but imagine yeah. Imagine good. something in between there that was preventing the interaction of those electrons, right? So there is the friction that stops one, which is causes shear or um, an inability of air to move at a particular speed is between one block of air and another block of air. Now, imagine that you had a density of relic neutrinos condensate. Like So, so this is a weird thing. The condensate is the same throughout the universe, but it can be at higher densities in different places. It's a bit of a weird thing to consider, but when you see those classic images of a, uh, quantum, a coherent condensate of, say, cesium atoms, you have a little bit on the outside, but you have the concentration in the middle. There's more density of matter in the middle, but they're all sharing the same wave function. Okay, so what I'm saying is that where you see that seawater and it's incredibly dark because the air is moving very, very fast. And immediately there's a hard line and it's not even moving at all. This is the same thing we saw in the Suhouse Rail Car water in, in 2017. You had a, a torus that's able to move incredibly fast through the water this way. Meanwhile, right next to it, you have bits of dust in the water that are drifting, like almost like they can't be bothered going anywhere. So you have things that are moving incredibly fast next to things that are not moving at all. And so what I think is going on, there is a threshold. And at some point, there is um, there's no influence on the, the friction and shear you get between moving bodies or fluids. And then it is a complete cutoff. And so you can have air moving at incredibly fast speeds, and it's not affecting the air immediately adjacent to it, because it's actually this sea of dark matter that is being interacted by the toroidal moment that is enabling that, enabling that slip. It's the same, I believe, when you are looking at um, spoon bending. So you are able, so when the, in that 1983 CIA document I remastered uh, that was released, it's saying that when they analyzed the metals that were bent in the PK parties, it was at the crystal grain boundary. So you've got friction between fluids like water or air, I've just described two of those, the Suhas Ralkar experiments and the 1970s uh, um, thing that we saw uh, in the NOAA uh, imagery. Now I'm talking about between crystal grain boundaries. We know from our friends Matsumoto that these things occur at crystal grain boundaries. We know from John Hutchison they occur at crystal grain boundaries. We know that is an impedance change. That's what Ken Shoulders is saying. So all of these people are saying that it's occurring at this crystal grain boundary. This is what happened. So if once you've gone past slipping between fluids, you then have crystal grain boundaries where the dark matter is able to find clusters forming that enable the electron bonds between the adjacent crystals to be weakened. And so you get slippage. And so it makes the, the metal into a bit of a jelly, right? Now, the next level beyond that is the electrons in a lattice or in a chemical bond. So in a line reactor, you get free flowing of the materials. They're chemicals, but they're able to free flow, whether they be alumina or they be silicon dioxide or in the oh, case of aluminium. Why, go on. Yeah, this is why it's cold melt, isn't it? It looks like it's melted, but it can't possibly have melted because what, it's what is now, holding... now free to move. So, so, for instance, 
so I'm saying, like, for instance, that the pyramid is able to, um, I've argued that the 1918 uh, ball lightning in water may not have been boiling the water. The assumption was it was boiling because the water disappeared and it, it looked like there was bubbles and there was gas seemingly coming off. So they did a calculation and said it's producing this much energy in order to boil the water. I'm saying I don't think it's that. I'm saying the water is separating. OK, it is potentially just separating into water gas. By that, I mean it's not steam. It's gas of water molecules. Why? Because the what what makes water water? It's in a relationship between the mo polar molecules of water through the electrons that are part of their molecule, right? Now, if you do what I'm saying happens in the metal grain boundaries, in the metals, it what happens between the slipstream on the water spout and in the water in the Suhaus uh, Ralkar experiments. What I'm saying is you have this um, interaction where the water molecules stop bonding by their electrical interaction and just they come apart. And so that is they're doing this, they, they do that. And then they're able well, to they, they, they just don't other. bond to each other. The electron relationship yeah. between adjacent water molecules. So what are you doing when you're boiling? You are raising the thermal vibration of the water molecules to a point that they kick a particle off and it comes off as a piece of water gas, right? I'm saying it's not that. You're not, you're not th thermally moving these things. The electrons just cease to have a relationship with each other. And it just well, those are, the water should be theoretically a gas. It's the hydrogen bonding that stops it because it's, it's a smaller molecule than methane. Methane's a gas. So I say, well, yeah, why is water not a gas? Because it's the hydrogen bonding. So it's causing the hydrogen bonding to effectively disintegrate. It's just nullifying the, the ability yeah. of the water molecules to form a collective, right? So yeah. then, so that is part of what I'm saying is going on in the wind hex. And this is why I think the wind hex is so important because it seems to be able to more efficiently, it's, it's able to grind material for the energy input of just removing the water through boiling, right? So something else is going on that's being more efficient. Now, is it really the gr you're getting the grinding for free or are you getting the water removal for free? Possibly it's the water removal for three and the grinding is actually a lot of it is kinetic. OK, as in the other air, air base, gr partially air based grinder where you've got the vortices and they're smashing the bits together in the counter rotating sections. So so what I'm saying is it's not boiling that water out of there. The water is just ceasing to have a relationship with. So firstly, what happens is if you put something in there that is um, cellular, if there's any kind of water or, or or chemical bond that holds them together, they see like in like a van der Waals. It kills van der Waals. Like van der Waals is a relationship between things. A lot of people see it as the Casimir effect. So you've got the wavelengths and blah, 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 and they're joined together. Well, effectively, what it's doing is it's just removing the Casimir effect or the van der Waals forces, which are an, uh, partially electrical, and but also partially an electro electromagnetic relationship. It, it's basically releasing them. So, like, it, it just flies apart. It, it, as in Frank Polivka's words, explodes, but it's not really exploding. It's just coming apart. And so, the, as you push this forward, so th th this, I believe, if we can demonstrate this in the um, wind hex, when we get that operational, that is one step removed from what may be going on in the Great Pyramid. So the, let's say we have water down in the Great Pyramid, whether it's deliberately put down there or there's some kind of artesian well that they can change the, the flood level on and, and, and get it started with that. It doesn't really matter. But let's say the water's down there. I'm saying ball lightning can do this or the, rather the toroidal moment of the ball lightning can do it. And the water separates out because it removes the intermolecular bonding. The next level from that is the chemical bonding, which again is an electrical phenomenon. OK, it's a relationship between an anion and a cation. OK, and, and, and maybe it's ionic in the case of water or it's, the I, I, uh, it's ionic in the case of silicon dioxide. It's ionic in the case of aluminium oxide. Silicon dioxide and aluminium, and oxi uh, aluminium oxide is basically most of the crust. It's also what turned to a liquid in the Lyon reactors. OK, at... I seem to remember as well that the, the presence of an oxide seems to enhance the effects. 
In fact, they, they don't, nothing can happen sometimes unless you've got the oxide in there. Suddenly well, things it certainly start needs to happen. the oxygen. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And obviously in this experiment, we have oxygen because uh, there was deuterium in the oxide in the center, but we're, we're in an environment with 20% air. And like it's literally in the air that this is run in the open air. And so to a degree is the, uh, you know, uh, lightning <laughs> it's in the air right so there's there's always oxygen in place so is it the oxygen in in the ionic thing but then when you start to look look at um uh covalent things like boron nitride uh that's boron nitride is the covalent molecule that was not tested by tesla right but it was tested by parkamon and it survived a large degree i have samples of uh, of that even in this book here this is boron nitride that he used in one of his first really long-running experiments here. And I have it here. And that is sections of boron nitride, OK? All right. So I don't know whether Parkman was on to this specifically, but that's what he chose. But what Tesla used is either diamonds in, and it was diamond dust specifically, in carbonized bitumen. So he actually, his carbon button light bulb was layers of bitumen and then car you know you carbonize it but it had diamonds in there okay or it was silicon carbide and both the diamond structure and silicon carbide are uh um not uh, uh they're covalent rather rather than ionic but most of the rock of the earth most of the ground we sit on is ionic ceramics okay so like so if we can do this, then um, uh, if we push it beyond a certain level, I think it's then uh, doing this. It's it's splitting the water molecule itself. It's going beyond. And I think that this is the toroidal moment you see in some HHO generators where they seem to produce more HHO than other generators. And I think it's a lot to do with sound. Why? Well, what we see in the Amasa vibrator plates is the yin-yang structures, right? With the two pits. What are we getting in there? You are getting a, a, a counter-rotating vortices, but they are water next to metal. Metal is hydrophilic. That will cause easy water. When you have a toroidal that's moving like this with ions, where you've got charge separation going on, you will create the toroidal moment. You have a toroidal moment and anti-toroidal moment, okay? And the two, the, the two do this, they, they, they will uh, produce an intense toroidal moment. And I believe that that is what's able to split matter apart. And I think it's able to reach right into the nucleus and it's able to start tweaking at the, uh, um, the spin on the uh, quarks that are in the core of the nucleus. And, and we, the, 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 the Coulomb barrier is not a consideration. It's not a consideration. So mm -hmm. I, I think the, the wind hex, if we can demonstrate that it is genuinely producing water vapor uh, and test to see it, where the water vapor is, you know, we need to have lots of different humidity areas in there that don't get destroyed and stuff. There's so much work to learn to, about what the process is going on. Is it the same thing that we're witnessing? Uh, and then the, the, there's tiers. So the, the first tier is, uh, is changing the, the relationship of friction. Then possibly the next one is changing van der Waals, crystal grain boundaries and such. Then the, the, the next one is uh, molecular bonds um, uh, or intramolecular bonds, but also then molecular bonds in a chemical structure. And then it's nuclear structure and then it's subnuclear structure. And I believe all of these things, because you see CLADOS work move from producing a two to 10 times in 1980 in his cavitation heat generators to his 1997 to 2002 work to, um, you know, in 350 hours or three, 300, yeah, I think 300, over 300 hours, he's producing 55 elements. And so you get the yin yang, you get heavier and lighter element, and then you've got a selection of elements to work with. And so you progressively end up with a smorgasbord of elements. Okay. And this is what was seen in these other people that have done it, like, uh, um, Leclerc, like the Russians with with the hydrowave, and like um, the uh, work of um, um, what's his name, Roy Um and what we have seen with the Vega experiments. So I think this is a tool set 
where you interact with spin. Um, and you shut down the, the, the first and most useful one practically is shutting down the modes of action of electrons binding material together at various different tiers of, of ability of the electron to play a role in binding different materials together and elements and substructures of, of atoms. And that's it. I think it's just, it's one tool which is able to do all of this. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, I, I think so too. The, the other thing is, when you think about the tornado, uh, it's sort of a salt water. So I don't know, but maybe salt in the water. Oh, that might will aid with your aid ionic something. relationship as well. But yeah, if, yeah. You, if mm. you see, you still get tornadoes over ground where the ground is wet. I, I, I accept that the wet thing is important. And also you see that video or image rather where there's, there's, there's a, a, um, a, a hydrodynamic, so a water in uh, triggered vortex being produced uh, by a turbine from a, an aircraft jet, uh, which doesn't get simulated when you simulate it with a purely fluid dynamics because you're not including now, his work goes to, to tr a long way to try th this. I, I, I'm going to go and get the link in a minute <laughs> so I can refer to him by name. But his work goes a long way to saying none of these things are explainable unless you start introducing charge. OK, mm -hmm. but even that doesn't ex explain fully what you see. And well, I believe you know, on, on, uh, aircraft, when, when you see them come into land, they get the swirl from the. Uh, that's definitely a vortex forming. Oh, oh yeah, the wind that's tips. part, part and, of how they work. Yeah, it's like that. And they, they have they have those kind of aerofoil things that stick up a bit to reduce that. Mm -mm -mm. So that obviously interferes with the process. So yeah, the, the, again, you see it very markedly in wet air. <laughs> when the plane's coming in, it's wet. You really see these things. That's why they have to be three minutes apart as well, because the effect is Yeah, because quite it messes strong. up the flight dynamics of the incoming plane. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so, mm -hmm. so like... Uh, so yeah, I think I think we we need to get the moisture in there, and and what Chris Scott has done down in Australia with his cappuccino variety, and seeing something that looks like current being induced, as 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 David said, well maybe this is actually uh, some induced type of magnetism into the Hall effect. Well, the Hall effect is a semiconductor. Well, it might be affected by the toroidal moment. So like, what are you actually seeing when you're seeing that? Are you actually just potentially finding a way to observe the the toroidal moment <laughs> um i don't know uh is it real current well let's see if he can do real work if he can't do real work then something else is going on which is messing up with the the whole device um so yeah so uh, uh, do you have anything to, uh, else to add to that no that's fine in fact Gordon, it's soon so my Betty boys. <laughs> ah, yeah. That's right. You're getting your beauty sleep. Of course. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so, does so anyone I'll, else? I'll... Thank, thank you very much, Gordon, for your contribution. Does yeah. anyone else want to uh, chime in on the ego out? Um, the, what the various experiences that happened. You know, it's really encouraging to see a, a change in John Hutchison's uh, approach to his legacy in the last day. Um, it's really important to see. Um, you, you, you know that the, there's this been this renaissance in in Takaaki Matsumoto, and so like all the people that supported that, you can pat yourself on the back and and know you know and and people that 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 have you know even the seven dollars or five dollars or whatever to the the blog that I run that helps me and that helped me go over there, um and you know we're in this situation where now someone very serious in the town who's probably got access still to all of the tools of the university is able to work on this with Dr. Takaaki Matsumoto. And it's just like, wow, he, he, he put that book out there in 2000 and here we are in 2023 and it's the first time in someone in his hometown took it seriously. And it's, it's not no one, it's the head of the university that's just retired. So it's just, it's, it's awesome. So like, I like to see more of that happening and and I would like to see this snowballing where more and more people are, um, uh, you know, taking it seriously and and doing something rather than just thinking about it. So, so yeah, thank you. If you want to go to sleep, Gordon, that's fine. Uh, anyone else want to jump in on the subject of ego out? Don't be afraid. <laughs> Artifact, do you have anything to say? I, I, I thank you for your. Um,
<laughs> I think you ran away. No, he's there. That was, that was... Anyone want to jump in? Raise your hand. Down the bottom, you can uh, do a react. Go down to reactions, and you can click on raise your hand, and I can I can bring you in. Anyone? <laughs> Peter. Steve. Hi, Steve. Right. I'll ask you to unmute. Sorry, maybe I you unmuted and then Steve, go ahead. You need to un hi. Hi, Steve. Can you hear can you hear me now? I can hear you clearly, yes. Okay. Hello. Thank you, Bob, for all your work. <laughs> Thank you. And, <laughs> um, interesting. Coincidentally, perhaps. I'm reading the um Steve Krivitz's book on um, Fusion Fiasco, which covers mm -hmm. sort of the, you know, the whole story of the Fleischmann and Pons. And um, I, I don't know how far, how deeply Martin thought into all of this, but he thought into it differently than I thought he did after, you know, after reading parts of this book. And he was convinced that, first of all, that, you know, the 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 results were real and essentially they were not fusion they weren't getting enough fusion they weren't getting enough neutrons they weren't getting en enough tritium they were getting some tiny amounts but not nearly enough to be accounted for by fusion so he knew it was some other reaction going on and he i don't know if he ever i i'm not that far into the book i hope this guy krivitz is actually a pretty good writer i don't know if you read that book but I haven't. Um, I know he's a journalist and he's very serious at getting at the truth. He had a little departure on uh, on a particular theory, which I think let him down because you, 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 yeah. you know, there, there are many theories and, and almost all of them must be wrong. Um, but uh, he's been very good at, at hammering um, the the subject of getting ITAR to, to admit that then they're, they're never actually going to be achieving excess energy. And, and he, right. he's delivered on that. It was a 10 year crusade, really was. And I know right. he's got another, another couple of irons in the fire. So go, go on, please tell me more. Well, so so I'm just, I want to share that, that you know, to my, uh, I, I, I won't even say surprise, delight that I found something with such deep, you know, uh, documentation of the whole, especially since I'm at the University of Utah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I sort of feel like this, this almost uh, metaphysical connection with all of this beyond my science interest in it. I mean, it's just like, in fact, the other day, the day of graduation, I was still in my regalia, the whole bit, my medieval regalia, and a friend and I decided we're going to go look up the Fleischmann and Pons lab and get a picture. Right. And we did. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I, had, I didn't know until someone told me very recently there was actually a plaque that, that is outside the library. I don't, have you ever seen this? I haven't, no, no. Oh, I, sh I should share, I'll share the, the yeah, video. Okay. Where, where should I share it with you guys? So if you go down the bottom, you can go to share screen. Oh, you want me to do it now? Yeah, go on. Turn on my camera. Well, I don't have to turn on my, I can. I was eating, I was eating, so I didn't turn on my camera, but let me, <laughs> let me. Uh... We all eat, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let me let me find it, pull it up, and I'll figure out how to share it. Uh, da, 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 da. Where is that thing now? Um, so the thing about that fascinates me about that whole story is the one cc palladium that actually went rogue, uh, and in my view, did exactly what ball lightning does, which is boil off all of the water break the silicon dioxide ceramic container and burrow its way as it apparently did to make a fist-sized hole in the ground uh yeah concrete floor now i have a point to note on that i was sent something by a it's a really good paper actually and and i will do a separate presentation on this but what they're saying is that if you have a mass that is below the Planck mass, it has uh -huh. no, that is below the Planck mass, it has uh -huh. no gravita gravitational pull. It doesn't 
Um, oh, here we go. Oh, there we go. Yes. That's the plan. I'm sorry, I'm, it, it's a little bit out of focus, but I see you can still read it. material laboratory. I can see that. Yeah, yeah. In the basement of the Irene Chemistry Building. You know, we actually had the, it was most, the building was almost empty because it was graduation day. And we were wandering around having to find a grad student. <laughs> in her office and we said by the way do you know do you know anything about the Fleischmann and Pons lab and she said oh cold fusion and I went yep and I had I was a little bit surprised that she was so familiar with it because I've approached the chemistry department at Utah about this about joining seminars or whatever and it's still like absolutely verboten to talk about this. I mean, they say, no, it's pathological science. We don't want anything to do with it. I said, you know, and I'm going, oh my God, you don't know how crazy you guys are. So um, so so this this was one thing. The second thing I did want to share to your okay. point of trying to figure out how to do something, you know, I don't have <laughs> the time, I suppose, to, you know, go do the all the the experimental work that you guys do. I've got a few other things going on. But what I am doing. Is I'm uh, in the middle. I, I have to finish it this month. Mm -hmm. Knock on wood somewhere. A uh, proposal to the National Science Foundation. Oh, great! Yeah, to, to re uh, re uh, invigorate their October 1989 interest in cold fusion. They had a conference, you know, in New York. Martin and Stanley were there, and Edward Keller was there, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. forth. It was, and it, you know, Teller basically said, "Look, I think you guys are onto something. Keep going," <laughs> and you know, and therefore all of our community bloomed from that in a in a sense. I think in some strong sense. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, so I'm putting in a proposal to those guys to to try to figure out. And I'll need your help on this. I'm sort of announcing this to the world, I guess, a little bit here. Oh, awesome. But, but um, to try to put together a group of the, the wise heads in the community to focus on, let's think about what are the, the experimental results, the technologies that we're aware of that have the highest probability of success in some finite time. And what will it take, funding, what will it take to complete complete them to success, and and out of this, I'm proposing to NSF that we come out with funding proposals that will go to whoever. We'll just shop them around. And so I'm trying. That's what that's what I can do. I can do that partly because I've got you know I'm I have my my um, perch in academia, so I can do that with NSF. And so far, they haven't turned me down. It hasn't been easy to find someone, frankly, in there, but I'm getting closer. So so I wanted to share that. I'll look for your input on that. I mean, case, well, very briefly, what I can say is um, they're not interested in finding a solution to radioactive waste disposal. And <laughs> so because that was yep. my top when, when I realized when whenever you get these technologies uh, uh, working to a degree where they start doing stuff interesting, they start chewing the reactor, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> um, right. And and so like if it's going to destroy things, let's get things that it is useful to destroy. So let's take radioactive material like strontium 90 and and uh, or or uh, cesium 137 and so forth now when i approached parkamov about this he says well you know just use the hydro wave and at that time i didn't really understand what the hydro wave was and the fact that it verified cladov's work and the fact that they they'd taken strontium 90 and within i don't they they reduced it a huge amount in just a few minutes of operation and and cladov's took i think it reduced it 55 uh, uh, percent in a very short period of time so like um uh the the cavitation process in in that is what was being proposed by us uh initially alongside the hho process which i believe is almost instantaneous as brown demonstrated in uh the us in 1992 but that you know what nine nine sigma came back and they said Actually, we don't want to make in the second proposal. It was we, we took out the Russians and we took out the British <laughs> and it was just Japanese doing a Japanese solution to a Japanese problem. Um, and they came back and says, well, OK, now you've shown us the quantitative and qualitative data and we've got rid of all the foreigners. Uh, <laughs> they didn't say that. But anyway, uh, um, they said uh, they, they said, like, uh, we don't actually want to make this material extinct. 
we want to concentrate it. So it, they, they moved the goalposts when we found a solution and could provide them the data to show that it would work. Uh, so either they want no one to have it and dump it to sea by diluting it to below the threshold level of which it's legally allowed to be uh, emitted to the sea, um, or they want to uh, concentrate it so they can use the tritium probably in fusion experiments. And so, because it's so incredibly valuable. And, and, and this is the problem we face because if Japan really solved the problem, then, every, then there would be calls by other nations in France and UK and in Russia and in uh, South Korea and in India and in, in America for this, why are you still dumping this tritium into the sea? when there's this technology to, you know, remediate it, the, you, you know, so I, I firmly believe that it isn't Nine Sigma, which is the evaluating body that put the block on that. I think it's the people probably, and I, I, probably General Electric or whoever is that, that manages the fuel cycle of that type of reactor, if it is General Electric, if I've got that wrong, I'm sorry to General Electric, but I, I believed it was. Um, and so uh, I, I, you know, I think there's someone behind the curtain that's saying, no, we can't have this technology being made available because then then there would be no excuse for saying we can't do it, <laughs> you know. Um, right. So I, I've moved on. And, and this is where I think things are most valuable to use the process that underlies this to de deliver technological processes that enhance the efficiency of manufacturing. OK. Now, I would love to be able to do uh, to have the tools right now to turn aluminium into a jelly, push it into a mold, drain off the excess charge clusters and, and cast metal that way. Um, so that, that and, and this is the way that is being said to be done in 1992 in this book right here and in this book right here. OK, so um, it's already said to be impossible, but. What I found is that if you accept, and I'll do a separate presentation on this with slides and, and detail, if you accept that electro discharge mach machining is not an arc discharge, but it is a kind of plasma that forms around the electrode, and they typically use copper or uh, electrodes in this or brass, they, the electro discharge machining tool bit, or in the case of wire electro discharge machining, the wire is able to cut through tungsten, it's able to cut through whatever, but every spark every, at the start of every spark or every coherent ball plasma uh, is, is EVOs. So I believe these technologies are actually already being used. And, and I think uh, um, this process was initially, uh, it was discovered in Russia, I think in the 1930s, wire electro discharge machining. And it's incredible. You can cut almost anything, regardless of its hardness, um, and you can do rough cuts by having the current at a certain level, and then you can reduce it, and it happens underwater or hydrogen-bearing oils, okay? Mm. And I believe it's just ball lightning. It's, it, it's literally what Matsumoto was doing, but it's an industrial process. So I believe there's all, and I'm going to, if I can get to speak at, at, at ICCF, I'm trying yeah. to try and point out where the process behind Lena is already being used industrially. That'd be, and that'd the, be a, a great, a great point of communication to, to everybody. everybody. I hope, I hope you can make that link. I mean, I'll use it. I mean, frankly, the the reason I'm and, and you know NSF applications are a pain in the ass. I mean, they are just unbelievable process and the labyrinthine nature of that whole organization, trying to figure out who's who and who you can talk to. But I'm making progress. <laughs> if, if they, whether they accept it or not, if they don't do it, I'll go on to, I don't know, DOE or someone, even though I think they're probably less interested. But um, the, the, the point is to try to, uh, if NSF, you know, approves this, they haven't done anything, I, I don't think, since 1989, literally. Right. That was they had a conference right. that year, and that was it. And then it got quashed, so they walked away. Well, I'm telling them now it's time to, you know, I'm reminding them of the history. And I'm saying there's been a lot of stuff going on in the last 34 years. Well, and, you, you and, know, the shocking thing is, I, I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm, trying, to get, on, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get scientific credibility. I figure if NSF buys in, that'll help, you know? 
And it, but so here's the thing is we are losing out, but people are actually practically using this technology in other countries. And one of the biggest ones is China. So so for instance, this this head of this uh, university, former head of the, the Sapporo University, he reached out and I was asked some follow on questions from what I discussed in the presentation earlier, where he said, like, have you got any examples of, uh, you know, brown gas cutting? Because it, we already know that the Amara mm -hmm. gas can cut some fairly thick materials. And um, it would appear to be doing like a, a constant Usherenko effect. So an Usherenko effect, if you don't know what it is, is they take mm -hmm. a, a normal shaped charge. And instead of having a bit of copper that forms a slug that goes through, they replace it with standard sand. And some of the particles of sand bounce off. The majority of them do. But some of the particles of the sand actually go into steel 30 centimeters and they produce a channel and along the channel you have transmuted materials okay so this has been mm -hmm. replicated quite a lot and this this you know there, there was a paper put out by uh, dr graham hubler which is embarrassing frankly because he he used the shape charge just say it was a plastic deformation of metal and that's it's nothing more than a, a shape charge effect that's going on with an evo He's missing the point that exactly the same process is used to make the Sherenko effect, but you're getting a little sand grain that's able to go 30 centimeters into to steel, which is like bonkers, like when you think about it. So something much more interesting is going on. And it seems to form this coherent matter that as it goes through, leaves transmuted material behind it. And um, so uh, essentially, um, I believe this is what's going on when, when, when they take... So he asked me if you've got an example. So I sent him this video from China where they have this piece of steel. And I think it must be 50 centimeters thick steel, right? Wow. And, and they get the HHO jet and it's it's like a Mars gas. They, they turn it on. It's real time producing the HHO and they cut clean through this uh, um, piece of like 40 centimeter, 50 centimeter thick steel. OK. And so, so yes, how do, is, let me let me. Make sure I understand. They're cutting through 40 centimeters. Yes. Is that but correct? what they have to do is they have to come onto the edge. They have to set up the coherent matter. And once they set it on, they can actually have a stepper gear. And it just, it once once it started cutting with what I believe is a coherent matter, they then just, once it's gone all the way through, they then they have the coherent matter beam because it's in a channel. The channel force it forms shear. The shear produces a toroidal moment on the plasma ions that are going through, which produces the coherent matter beam. And the coherent matter beam then cuts through. So once they've got it set up, and, and because mild steel has carbon in it, there will be a thermal effect going on. So you do get heat mm -hmm. going on as well. Um, uh, some, some of the coherent matter is thermalized. But then, then they have like a stepper motor and they just set it off and, and it just comes back at a, a set speed, making a very nice clean line, huh. cutting through this incredibly thick steel. So like when we did it with the tungsten, we see transmuted materials. When we see it with the copper 10, 10 yen coin or, or mostly copper 10 yen coin, we see this uh, uh, structures that can only be due to monopoles and coherent matter um, because of the way they're structured and because of the way the arrangements of the elements that have been synthesized. And so um, these technologies are already being used. Well, that's an important, a very important point. I mean, I, I, I'm, I mean, when I talk to people about stuff like this, right, they go, oh, that's over unity, isn't it? I said, well, absolutely it is. <laughs> well, no, and, and, the way I and, kind of look but, at it right now, it's if you were to use a traditional manufacturing process, you would have to use a certain amount of energy and there would be a limit to which the minimum amount of energy you would need to apply to, occur, to do the, the, the particular right. process you're looking at. Because this is, uh, and like I said in, in the early part of this chat, most of these processes require modifying the way electrons interact with other matter. It is basically all, everything, right? Right. And what, it, what this appears to do, in my view, is it, it gets in between the way that an electron can interact with other matter. Uh, yep. And so it changes okay. relationships. So you do things in, in a non-thermal, much, much more efficient way. And so, and, and, and in the case of like, when you're doing nuclear remediation, for instance, with the case of thallium-205, it's stable to the end of time. But if you remove all the electrons, that is to say you completely ionize it, leaving a bare nucleus, it does a positron emission. It ends up, uh, uh, is it positron or whatever? It ends up as, as lead 205, 
and then it decays back to um, uh, uh, thallium-205 with a period of time. But it would never hmm. decay in that mode without removing all the electrons. Now, imagine you have a process that messes up all of the way the electrons can interact with the nucleus and keep it stable. And it starts messing with the electrons that are putatively inside a proton with a neutrino making a, uh, a neutron, if you know what I mean. Because mm -hmm. if a neutron, mm -hmm. a neutron decays, it decay, decays in, uh, into a proton, electron, and an antineutrino. Well, if you're bringing mm -hmm. in cold relic neutrinos, it's messing up the antineutrino that's in there. So the electron that's associated with the proton kind of fall apart. So the matter falls apart. And if you already have an unstable element like strontium-90, cobalt-60, yttrium-90, uh, yttrium cesium-137, it already wants to lose the electron. The electron is already raring to go of its own accord. And if you bring something in that just tweaks its uh, uh, current ability to stay within that nuclei, you're going to get a rapid decay of that nuclei. So the, th the other industrial process, which I think is interesting, if, if they won't allow us to do remediation of nuclear waste, the other process I think is really interesting is to synthesize new elements. And it would appear that cavitation is well proven to do this, okay? And of course, the first question I get asked is how do you make gold? Like, and it's like, it's tedious. Sure. So that's why I did a presentation a long time ago. So you say, yes, you can make gold, right? Do you need to say that it's picograms per gram? I don't know. At some point, <laughs> someone will find out the right combination of resonances and the right combination of starting ingredients, which is most likely to be mercury and potassium or, or lead and potassium or, or uh, uh, bismuth and potassium or calcium, uh, as was used by the ancients. Um, so, and, and it turns out that those are the most likely, but they still produce a smorgasbord of other elements. In, because it's it's kind of like a stochastic process, but also it's a resonant dependent process. So you might only have hmm. a proportion of your uh, driving signal at the resonance that would lead to the particular outcome of synthesis of gold. Now, my view is if we can understand and accept that this is a process that has the ability to do that, which it clearly seems to be able to do, and we can trivialize it to the point where if you're five year old and you have you can you can manage to get thirty five dollars out of your parents, you can start synthesizing elements with ki kitchen stuff, right? <laughs> Which right. the experiment Ultras to ultrasonic uh, yeah. cleaner and piece of aluminum foil. Exactly. And I forget what the the and water and a bit of electricity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. just to provide the the stimulus for the electronics that provide the sound. Okay. So. Yeah. We've got it down to this level of simplicity. It only becomes the belligerence and the desire to not know of, of people around the world who got certain qualifications and it, it would make nonsense of their qualifications. And people that still fear the same fear that people have in that laboratory where you're taking that photo that's on the screen right now. OK, <laughs> you know, yeah. you, you need to overcome that. So you need to make it so comically simple. I mean, it, other than the, the Matsumoto's experiment, which is technically simpler because it, you actually don't need to buy, you just need the lead wire, but not a lot of people have a pure lead wire and, and they, not a lot of people have potassium hydroxide hanging around. Not a lot of people have the ability to analyze it. So the, the, the ultra experiment for me is the simplest we've got to so far. Um, and I don't think it needs to be any simpler to, to demonstrate the process. Once you can show that you can synthesize new elements and we seem to be able to make silver quite readily you know, a couple of experiments have produced silver, okay? So, like, and it's interesting because you've got calcium and then silver. And when we did HHO on um, calcium carbonate, it actually had bands of, uh, of what appeared to be high silver concentration, okay? So there seems to be yeah. some relationship between when you when you start to do the HHO or the, the water cavitation, which will be producing HHO um, in there, you end up start seeing to produce silver, but if you drive it further, you get heavier and heavier elements. So, like you know, so you can get to your picograms of gold. You can get to, <laughs> and you might find that you can develop a process relatively simply. Now, then you start to have people saying, "Well, then you'll make gold valueless." And it's like, well, but hold on, hold well, on. Here's the point. Here's the point. It's not gold. 
It's not gold. It's all of these so-called rare earth elements where we're being held to ransom because we don't have the mines functioning because they're with exactly. the cut by price. Not because it's rare. They're actually not that rare. There's a lot rarer elements that we use that is produced in the West, for instance, right? But there, yeah. there's, there's a phenomenal amount where I used to live in Kerala. The monazite deposits down there are absolutely ridiculously. I used to live on a mountain of monazite, right? Um, hmm. So these things, are, they, they exist there for people to, to, you know. But what happens if you develop a process that doesn't involve crushing the environment of, of Kerala, but you can just make the elements you want? You make all of the neodymium. You make all of the gadolinium. You make it, Right. You're not going to end up with the gadolinium one five two or whatever because the process gets rid of that quite quickly. <laughs> so, it's the only so that, I, I don't want to take up I don't want to take up all your time, but I just wanted I I took this opportunity to let you know you know and this group know what what I'm trying to do to help. And if it gets to the point with NSF that says, well, we I lost you. I lost your audio. Just a sec. Say again. When when you get to the point with the NSF. Um, they they if, say if if they get to the point where they say well this sounds like it may be interesting we want to know more about the science i may have to reach out to you guys to help at that stage so that's sure. a that's an early warning heads up sure i mean the, the science is <laughs> and i've already i've already talked to a couple others i won't name names but uh, about this so mm -hmm. um i'm trying to start slowly building you know Supporting the community, go because you know every time I go to an ICCF, it's like, well, if we got more funding, we could we can make more progress. And I go, and I, you know, you know Jed Rothwell, right? He's got this he's engineering brilliant. estimate. Yeah, he is. He's got this engineering estimate of how much cheaper these reactions are going to be to generate energy, right? And I'm, you know, just a dumb old economist, but I take data like that and I can convert it into well, what's the scale of replacement of carbon energy going to be? That's easy. That's standard econ. A little more difficult, but I think I've got it worked out. How long is it going to take in order to re actually replace all carbon sources? You know, and that actually, if I get, if my talk gets accepted at ICCF 25, that, that'll, I'll, that's what it'll be about. It'll well, be those great. scale. I, I mean, from the point of view of carbon, like if we can use there's this guy called Malcolm Bendel, and he's doing a kind of geek like process. Um, and <clears throat> there, there's some merits to what he's doing because the, he, he's like doing like the hydro wave technology has a, a HHO generator before it goes through the cavitation process, right? So it's actually splitting mm -hmm. with an arc before it goes through. And it, it, this was designed to remove biological and chemical wastes, uh, and then they found it could do transmutation of radioactive materials. He's actually doing a bit of that all, all prior. So he's creating what he calls uh, uh, plasmoids on, yeah. on the, the Ken shoulders. And that is being fed into a geek like process with the counter, you know, the exhaust fumes. But it's really efficiency. And he's claiming the same kind of efficiency gains as was credited to the geek. But the geek is not a refined technology. But both of them are promising the, the fuel efficiency burn ratio the energy out of your petrol let's say which is normally around about 33 percent going to 66 percent. so it's 100 percent more efficient it's still not over unity but if you can use half the fuel to do the same work no it's all in the right the direction fuel reserves. it's all in the right direction but i you know i'm i i believe i'm one of the people that reads the science believe re, believes that we're you know faced with the global warming challenge and to fix that i know not everyone does and that's fine i don't want to you know debate that part but i do and that drives what i'm what i'm going after you know what i'm trying to figure out which is to get a replacement for carbon based fuel sources anything along the way including efficiency improving efficiencies is a step in the right direction there's no question about that so I lost you after and you said the replacement for carbon based yes. source, sources and then you said and well but anything along the way like doubling the efficiency of of uh, of oil sources is is a step in the correct direction and I, I so, agree and as you probably know I I believed in cold in in anthropomorphic global warming until probably about four or five years ago it's been the motivator yeah. throughout my life 
And so, um, but th there's other reasons other than potentially an anthropomorphic driven uh, uh, global climate change or whatever it's called these days um, to do it. And, and from my point of view, it's I have had the pleasure since I was about 17 or 16 to travel to third world countries. And I've seen people go into a forest, which is supposedly protected, walk past people from their community that are defending the nature reserve, and they're letting them in to go and collect firewood because they're going to be cooking the food that they're, they're going to be eating later that day, right? Right. So the, the guards are letting the people in and, and the, the forest still gets damaged. And I've seen all over the world, it doesn't matter whether it was in Borneo, whether it was in Africa, whether it was in Indonesia, uh, whether it was in uh, uh, Central America, huge swathes of forest chopped just for cooking a meal. If you can give a clean option for cooking a meal to people that doesn't involve damaging the environment, it's a huge- And, and walking that. miles a day often, right? Well, Spending a lot yeah. of time. Yeah, exactly. Sending kids out, sending kids out and set, you know, gather wood instead of go to school. Or even to get I mean, it, it, water or things like that, yeah. Right. Yeah. So th there are so, a lot so, of things, go on. So, 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 I mean, it, it, so I, I'm starting because it's convenient with the, the uh, programs at NSF with the global climate change, right? Yes, of they have there's a lot of that. Yeah, there's a lot of support for that kind of thing. So, getting in there at that angle is a, is a good approach. I, I'm an economic historian, right? And uh, a student of the English Industrial Revolution as an energy revolution for crying out loud. That, that was my dissertation, <laughs> and I estimate. I mean, with Jed's beginning numbers on lower cost. We will be seeing beyond all this global warming stuff. We will be seeing uh, the 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 economic incentive to have at least ten times the um, growth effect, social effects, cultural institution, everything that follows on from from this new energy source. So well, that you know, you is are a, a great correct. step. Yeah, great step at, at reducing global poverty and on and on and on. And, and that is it. So the, 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 as you are very well aware, and maybe others are here too, of course, we are the choir, um, uh, the, in economic terms, I don't think maybe probably, uh, it used to be 150 years, I think probably for the 160 years, you've never seen a significant increase in the GDP of a country uh, uh, or the per capita GDP when you haven't had an increasing use of energy. It's kind yeah, of like exactly. Hand -hand. I mean, that's my research for crying out loud. I, you know, I yes. <laughs> so, so uh, it's not it's not widely known. You're right. Yeah, um, but within our community, I think it's reasonably well known. But if when people are watching this video in in, in the future, it's, it's as well to uh, say that because that is oh, a yeah. huge motivator. Because right now, I mean, got... the correlations are huge actually between energy inputs and GDP total living standards essentially outputs. There is a very strong correlation through across time and space. And so, in, in, no question. It, yeah. And it's not just, it's actually, when you get down to it, it's the ability to do work that has utility that is the most important thing, right? Sure. So, so like, it, strictly speaking, it's been done by brute force, generation upon generation. They've, they, they've used often the same technology to deliver uh, more work by doing more of the same. But if you, if you can deliver the same work with less energy, you can increase the GDP that way, but it's, it's a harder Absolutely. game to play. So, so if, if you have a step change in a, an ability to do the end work, and this is why I think from my point of view, I'm trying to focus on where this technology is already being used stealthily. I think that's great. I think that's great. You know, and you've, You've uh, caused me to focus on that part of your thinking today, listening to you today. And uh, I, again, I may reach out to you, depending on where this thing with the NSF goes in terms of convincing them that we need, you know, we need, we need to get very serious about uh, supporting this area of technology. Forget That's about the hot fusion. That, <laughs> go, go. Yeah, forget, <laughs> don't, yeah, I mean, honestly, forget about it. It's not going to work. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And Stephen Krivitt has written the book on that. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> so it's yes, if you haven't read that one, you need to read that after you Well, read he's it. got this big three volumes and covering right. the whole space. I'm in the middle one is on the placement of ponds and just because of a variety of reasons, both the NSF stuff and just historical interest at Utah, which the story just isn't known at Utah. Very few people know it, right? Because it became pathological science. They got a, they got burned at the university. But I think it, that it it's time to start, uh, you know, sort I, of- I think uh, of all of that story, the most important story is the 1CC. Uh, yeah, right. And burning through the desk. Whatever you whatever you have, as far as all of the other explanations for cold fusion, unless it explains that experiment, it's right. not valid. It has to also. Right. That's a great. That's a that's a fantastic story. I do repeat that one. People go, "Are you serious?" And I say, "Yeah." And I, you know, it, the lab was locked. I tried to get in. <laughs> so and I'm going to talk. So the, the I'm grad student about, didn't have a key. <laughs> I'm going to talk about this um, quantized gravity paper. And what they're saying is that if you have particles, so the, the, the thing about that Pons and Fleischmann story that sticks in my head is when they came in and, and saw the devastation in the lab, the room was apparently filled with these fine suspended particles of matter, which presumably yeah. were parts of the apparatus and parts of the concrete floor. Yeah. Now, yeah. as anyone knows, sooner or later, particles of matter normally descend and form a, so, a, a layer on the ground so this quantized right. matter this quantized gravity says that if you have a mass of material which is not already somehow like van der Waals or whatever bound to another piece of material if it drops below the Planck's mass which is 22 micrograms which incidentally is the same minimum mass you need to create a black hole according to Stephen Hawking right so and I'm saying a black hole is a toroidal moment it, what they're saying is that if you fall below 22 micrograms, there is no gravity. That it, it doesn't have any gravity, that piece of matter. So it'll just float. Sorry? It'll just float. It'll just float. It'll move around <laughs> with air currents. Sure. But it, it won't I, I, hadn't, I hadn't focused on that part of that, that great story. But that's yeah. a very good point. Excellent. And so point. the other thing that they say is that you can get clumping if you can manage to charge these particles, and then they clump together like a a, a fur ball, like 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 a, a dust ball, a dust bunny, uh -huh. right? So you can get these twenty two microgram below particles. Now, what we see with this process, it seems to be able to produce extremely small particles. If statistically some of the particles are below this twenty two microgram limit, then that They're would explain. Gravity. This that would explain this observation by Pons and Fleischmann, and so yeah, so th that for me is is a a, 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 a real I I've been trying to deal with how did that occur, um, and uh, and I think we finally have an answer. So I'll I'll do a presentation. That's fantastic, Steve. So, thank so, you very so much. I, listen, I apologize for you know taking so much of your time. You've been very generous, and the people on the call have been patient or not i mean i hope i i hope i didn't scare anyone off well, here, I, but... I think what you did is you spoke when no one else was speaking so uh i'm gonna lower your <laughs> hand i'm gonna ask uh, if anyone but, else wants but to. but yeah. so number one martin knew it wasn't fusion he yeah. didn't know what it was so yeah. he was just ahead of his time you know and uh, many in many areas and i don't know if he would ever gotten to where we've gotten in the last 30 years but he was on the right track and the second thing is i'm going to try to do what I can figure out how to do this to get, you know, big science uh, to to re-accept this as, as a real technology that's um, far superior to anything else that we have on the horizon and start investing in it. it listen, so, even if it's not, if they are serious about the doom and gloom and reasons to worry about everything sky falling in chicken little, right, right. If, if they are serious about that argument and they are serious, why would you not try? I, exactly. That's my argument. It's like, why is everything else on the table except this one thing? Well, because it got such a bad rap in, in you know, starting in 1990. It did. I mean, why? You know, why did it get such a bad rap? Well, well, I mean, Kribitz lays it out. I knew the story. It's because the two guys that wrote the, the guy from MIT and the guy from Caltech that wrote the report for DOE were hot fusion guys. So, so they were they were saying, 
Well, you know, and it's widely known. Krivitz again repeats the story. They were they were deathly afraid of this technology because how do they get their tens of billions of dollars worth of experiments and all that stuff funded if you can do it in a beaker on a lap on a, on a lab table? <laughs> and that's the story. I mean, that is the story that I think is most credible behind that particular you know pathological science report. But that's the one that gets quoted the whole time. So we got to get over that, get beyond it. You just have to look at the intervening science, and we've gotten more and we've gotten better at replicating. Um, and to come and so back forth. to what Jed Rothwell has done, he's he's added. Uh, so I, I I tried to do this back in 2013. I applied for a government grant in the UK. Yeah. What they yeah. wanted was to they they wanted to support programs that were going to use big data technology to analyze large data sets to come up with uh, better ways of understanding those data sets to lead to technological advancements at the cutting edge, right? Well, so that's I said, not unreasonable. Uh, there's this Lenacana database. I said, it, uh, everyone that comes to, into this field has to make the same mistakes, repeats experiments, thinks they're inventing something new, when if they could find a drill into that data that's already published and find commonalities and find best practices, then it would allow people to kickstart and get into the. You know what they said? They said, they said, they said your. No, firstly, they wrote back and said, "I'm a, so, very sorry, but your your application did not reach the standards that that we require right. for this funding program. Good luck next time." Right. So I said, I, I wrote out and said, "This is literally exactly what you were asking for. It's big data." perfect application exactly with the end goal that you're asking for so i said can you give me more detail on what meant what what caused this uh, application to fail and they wrote back and said cold fusion is not real right right <laughs> that's well, it it's time it's time to get beyond it and so what, you know what I'm jed has do done it. what jed has done is he's put gpt 3.5 which is probably it, better exactly than he's using chat gpt yeah. so to, i just i just i was trying everything to in, in the data set I was demonstrating this to someone today and I said, um, look, here's an example. I'll go on there right now. I've never asked this question of his bot. And I, I asked the question, uh, what are the correct size? Oh, 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 what sizes of uh, palladium electrodes have been found to be good in uh, palladium deuterium electrolysis experiments? And it came out right. with various authors that, that used and, and the different ranges of electrodes they used and, and, and which, which, which results yeah. they've gotten. And so on, and 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 also additionally added the fact that different currents on different sizes of electrodes, and it's like already I could see how powerful that was. We could have had yep. something similar ten years ago. Yeah, you know we didn't, so now we do. No, and so my point that about today's presentation, this, this start presentation, is we have to do everything we can. And thank absolutely. you, thank you very much, Steve, for taking the initiative that you're doing because it's that kind of initiative that needs to be done in many many places to absolutely deliver so thank you right absolutely. so uh, i'm gonna so, see if there's anyone else go, go on if you want something <laughs> to close out there yeah. okay i i'll apologize you know no, don't apologize because probably no one else is is is, is going to step in here so say what you need to well, say okay no i'm you had I'm, one more I'm image done, I, I enjoyed the conversation and look forward to seeing you at, at, in um how do you pronounce it jen, jen says jen <laughs> Sitchin. Poland. Sitchin. 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 Poland. In, in the okay. Czech Republic, we say Sitchin, but you can say Sitchin. Okay, I'll work yeah, on it's, that. It, it's a fantastic <laughs> thing to look at, though, as a word, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It sounds Chinese. <laughs> it does a bit, yeah. yeah. Cool. Cheers, uh, Steve. Anyhow. You had one more image, you. did you? Huh? Did you have one more image you wanted to share? Oh, I was just looking through the chat to see the comments. Yeah. And someone, uh, David and Dan, commented on the um, DOE, the DARPA E 10 million grant to a bunch, you know, eight or nine projects. And it, and you know what? They didn't get to the right people. <laughs> I'll say this because right I've people. said it publicly already. It, it's, it's military funding for military boys. Yeah. And in fact, I, uh, uh, you know, uh, on the uh, CMNS blog uh, uh, group stuff, Ed uh, Storms commented, because I asked him, I asked him, so are, who are these people, Ed? 
And he said, oh, well, basically what you said, but not, you know, little, little, anyhow. But he said he offered to RPE, DOE, RPE, to help them evaluate the incoming proposals. He never heard back. And I'm going, no, 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 no. Serious? I, 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 so listen, I was in a position to understand who was winning the British Travel Awards in the UK. And it was the people that paid the most at the table at the sure. award ceremony, right? Uh, sure. I've seen this in several different fields and it made me very jaded. It's like jobs for the boys. Almost certainly, I would say probably 70% of the people that were awarded. Um, and I don't know this at all, but I, 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 you know, I've seen the way the world works from all different angles. And I would suggest that at least 70% of the people that were awarded the grants were told, we're going to get this grant and you're going to get the money. Yeah, ahead of time. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and, so, and yeah. there might be some wild yeah. cards in there so that there's someone that stands up and say, well, you know, I had no idea that this was going to be available and I got some money. And, and that's that's the exception that proves the rule, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Right. So, uh, yeah. And at any rate, I, I, you know, I don't know. I have no idea. I mean, at NSF, which, uh, you know, people are aware of NSF, that's sort of the, the font of they, all they science seem to wisdom. They some interesting funding, don't they? They, well, for From example. From time to time. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm going to remind them I, in writing that mm -hmm. they saved the internet when it was yeah, right. head of Purdue. And they, yeah. they took it on and, and here we are, you know. Yeah. And they've done similar stuff in the past. So they're, they're able to think bigly if you get to the right people. So well, that's what I'm trying that. to figure out how to do. So Good luck with that. And I can pretty much assure you that anyone that can help you in this community, uh, I'm pretty, su pretty sure they would help you. And I, I will do my yeah. best to help you in any way. I, I totally appreciate that. And again, I, I, I appreciate the patience of the other people on the call for listening to us prattle on here. So thanks. <laughs> it's fine. You're a great talker anyway. So I'm sure then no one's upset. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, Steve. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'll, I'll mute you now and I'll ask if anyone wants to step in there, if anyone wants to yeah. address the points that Steve has made, if anyone wants to talk about ego out and and, and so on, if anyone's got any comments on uh, things or questions, far away. Raise your hand. If you go down to the bottom, go to reactions and go uh, click on the reactions thing and click on raise hand. Anyone want to step in there? Okay, Steve, can, just can you can you uh, unshare your screen? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. I can do it, Matt, from it here. But I, I, no, I got it. it. I got it. Okay, cool. Sorry. So, does anyone want to step in with a question there? I'll have a look through your questions and see if you've got anything in there. So, anyone? <laughs> oh, it's Alex. Sorry, I, I've got terrible connection here. Is it okay if anyone? I talk? Yeah, sure. You're on. You're on. Um, I I missed a bunch, but just because I mentioned since we're all here, I'm from Florida. Phosphogypsum is a big deal. Uh, I think it's BS. Are you familiar with it? Um, sorry. Did you say flotsam and jetsam? No, no. Phosphogypsum. Phosphogypsum. Like uh, it's the gypsum as in plants type the thing. This, the phosphate mines from which they make the uh, fertilizer right. apparently aggregate the radioactive isotopes in the soil. And so the, the, the spoils of the, of, of, of the results of the phosphate mining are, you know, slightly radioactive in the, in the case that's kind of, you know, it's, it's nothing. We all know that. But, but um, it's like, uh, it's a big deal. And they're always debating whether to use this gypsum for road building or whatever, but it's too radioactive. And my first thought was like, yeah, we could pass this through a vortex or, or cavitation and, 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 you know, and, and it would be fine. I mean, I think I could probably just, you know, the solution is pollution to pollution is dilution and just add more stuff into it and it wouldn't be as radioactive, but that's a whole other discussion. But I mean, if we could put some of this into a slurry or maybe even a Windex and when it comes out, it doesn't have, that's a, I mean, and I'm from Florida, so, you know, I could probably talk to the right people if if that's the thing. I, I that's something I was going to bring up. The other thing that okay, came so up. Hold, hold that point. So hold that point. Yeah. So on that, 
what are we talking about? Are we talking about alpha, beta, gamma? What are we talking about? Is the is um, it what is the I think it's the radon? Which one is that? Uh, I I think it's I think it's alpha. Gosh, I, I looked into it. Then I, you mean you know, when you brought it back up? I, this so alpha is not I a problem. It's alpha. You, you can stop alpha with just a skim of pretty much anything, right? So it's not that the 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 the, the beta is not a problem really either, unless yeah. it's your body, right? The the gamma is the one that's a real problem. Now, right. the typical gamma that you will see in most things is from potassium. And it's in your body anyway. Like <laughs> people have quite a bit. If you eat a banana. Yeah, I know bananas are more radioactive. I mean, I I, I know. I, I mean, that, that's what's so stupid about this is it's a completely created. It's a created crisis. Well, I, I mean, genuinely think that certain amount of radioactivity is important. OK, in the environment. Yes. In part, it's what triggers weather systems. It, it creates the ionized air, which leads to, you know, things going on. And, and this is why... up the Great Pyramid of Giza. Yeah, exactly. Where I was living... I mean, no, I got you. I mean, okay, I'm, down. So I'm, I'm not so overly concerned about that. Yeah, it, but, but if it's really high, then, like, for instance, some of the tailings that come out of uh, crack, uh, 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 fracking... They they can have some high uh, radio radioactivity in there because they might have some whatever they can have some quite high radioactivity so that's that's more of a problem in those materials. Well, just the thought was the thought was to do something like you know we want to do something that would get this information out or whatever and and maybe we could make money and if we could make money I would just pour it right back into this I mean that I, I care about well, getting it out no like one you. would blame you if you wanted to just have a decent life as well you know so like the, the if you can find a hundred people to convert aspects of this technology into technologies that make the people's lives better processes more efficient like I was saying to Steve if if you can take an, a manufacturing process and make it use half the amount of energy then you're you're going to end up with more GDP for the same amount of energy used because you're being more efficient with the energy you're using, right? You're going to break this lock with using more energy every year. So those those are the kinds of things that really you know they're exciting me now. Now I know no one's really interested in getting rid of radioactive waste. <laughs> While I'm here, I just figured I'd drop out a couple of other ideas that popped Go up on. as these are coming in. I kind of get these downloads like I think you do. Um, I have I've seen water spouts. I've like been under one, um, and you know it left a mark. And I can't help you know. So these happen naturally, like we say. They just occur and they run. So it seems to me we ought to be able to create the environment in which it happens at whatever scale, because we know this is scale invariant, and um, you know. I thought, okay, something like this is going on in, in the wind hacks. We all see that. But I'm looking out at my grill in the back in my backyard, and it's actually one of those elliptical ones, like an egg. And it's got a hole in the top and the bottom. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to rig something with, it, it turns out the auspicious symbol might be the thing to put in or actually turn it inside out and stick it in through the sides of the lid um, and put it in an even angle of the things. And I can hook it up to a small... I got a compressor right out there. It's like it was right there in front of me the whole time. The extra, the extra thing that I'm, you know, this is this is my next experiment, but I'm, I'm putting it out in the inspired by the ego thing. So anyone's welcome Fantastic. to take this or not. Yes. Or, you know, Bring it on. But, but I'm going to do it or something like this. I'm gonna, I'm adding in a carburetor for water so we can add moisture to the compressed air, either at the nozzle or somewhere. I'll work that out on the back nine. And and this comes this comes from my initial. I was the guy that did. Something like an inside-out heat reactor on my car when I was a kid, uh, and but I had a multiple spark discharge high energy ignition system, a plasma ignition system they called it back. Okay, in the day. and again, it's pretty trivial. We can hook up a battery and put it near the 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 jets inside mm -hmm. there, and it'll ionize the air. In my mind, you're really creating the the whole environment for a water spout or a tornado, and I, and I think you know empirically trial and error. As long as I don't, you know, overdrive it and go back in time or something, um, we're, we're gonna, you know, that that this is this is what I'm this is my version of the wind hex. That, that I, I'm I don't think you're gonna go back in time. You might freeze your <laughs> local time. But talking about yeah, yeah. You're creating the conditions, I was absolutely flabbergasted when Steve, not you, Steve, but the other Steve up in Canada, <laughs> he bought the Geet book, the Book of Geet, and in there there were three phenomena discussed. Okay. 
And two really stood out on me. One was they had a horizontal geet, right? Now, as far as I can say, so I'll say it here right now, the reason the geet needs to be oriented north when, you are, when you've got a horizontal geet, when you are conditioning it, is because it has the, the, the N moment uh, uh, sothic triangle toroidal moment coming out in one direction and 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 so you have to orient it north but when you are, have it vertical it has at least two of the n minus one vortices around it and they can swing round and orient them and orient themselves like a near yeah yeah, yeah. oh it's, of my self, it's self correct it's self correcting it's self correct exactly so it it doesn't need that problem so that one is explained done right now in this particular example, they had a horizontal geet, okay? And there was water on the ground. And it had, he describes in the book, a water spout comes up and it goes up to one end of the geet, but it doesn't touch the reactor. It's partially outside, which it employs, implies that it was catching the, one of the, the sub tools, toroidal moment coming out, okay? Hmm. And and it was pulling it in. It was stabilized in that position. Then it was yeah yes. okay because it's horizontal. Yes yes wow okay I easy got you. to explain. Same principle. Now the other one was he was demonstrating to a bunch of people, and he was powering this geet up and doing a lot of I think like closed looping of it. And you know what happened? The entire geet disappeared. I know. I have the book. I know. So you know. But that is easy to explain because this happens in our experiments. When you have the like like those little hemispheres that are eaten out of a Mars's vibrator plate, that isn't a cavitation explosion doing that. That is when the coherent matter sphere reaches a certain level and it just the bit inside disappears. <laughs> it just disappears. So these are the things that you don't necessarily want to have in technological processes unless it's to actually cut a channel through metal which I believe is what right. is going on because we, we've seen it. We've had a copper pipe, which is non-thermally had a sphere taken out as a section, right? Copper is thermally conductive. It's electrically conductive. Why does a ball plasma that we can see eat a spherical section out of copper and leave a hard cut edge? It's because it's basically, it's got some level of coherence or some phenomena which is causing it to completely eat it away. This is what we see in Matsumoto's work. It's what we see in Hutchison's work. It's what we saw in the Lion Reactor, a sphere taken out of diamond. Like, so it gets up to my... So in this case, the, the beauty of that anecdote from the Geet Reactor is we know that the, the maker and the breaker are separated to a degree and that the, the whole field came around that whole structure um, and made it disappear. So there's, some, there's a piece, piece of learning that can be brought out of it. I need to see the full quote in the book. But these things are easy to explain, but they've never been explained even by the inventor to this day. And so, yeah. We, 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 so, what other what other ideas have you got then? You, an inverted geek using the in the uh, the, um, Windex, the, the well. handheld version. I, I envision something almost the size of a grinder, uh, driven by compressed air. We just need to scale it down. Uh, I, I think don't I think was, it needs I'm, to I'm be driven, driven by compressed air. I think what you need is the output from a high pressure steam. Well, the other thought that I had is we can drive it with the exhaust from a generator, um, and and I could actually make a a fuel or a closed loop system like that. And I'm going to fiddle with that too. You could I possibly to, drive a... it from the exhaust of a generator, yeah, because yeah, you will have yeah. water in there, and it will be over 100 yeah. degrees. That might be a great way to do it. I'm always trying to think. I got that flash when I was. Yeah, I, I have I'm a generator in my think... food truck, and I I thought I saw it when I was lifting it out. I just got the flash of inspiration, and I'm like. Let's just cut to the chase and connect something to the muffler. And, you know, we I know you can close loop this. I mean, it, it's like the right, you know, you're right when it's quiet and cool and, and, and not emitting waste, heat or noise. And, uh, you know, I studied Schauberger when I was a kid and everything, too. And it's all coming together now. But, yeah, I think we could probably do something like that. And the key is, you know, we're picking stuff off the shelf and, and you know, I'll get out into the community and start, you know, making sure this gets known by people who have a vested interest. Like in Louisiana, if I can do something reliably with a boat, then all the fishermen don't need fuel. And and I mean, that's a huge deal. 
Uh, yeah, but uh, if, if, for instance, you develop a manufacturing technique where you can carve and cut stone or metal preci with precision, like a laser, and you've just got like a little handheld device, um, that's going to be transformational as an engineering tool. And so, like, and this is going to be useful for unimaginable types of uses. <laughs> like, when you put a tool like that out there, you can't imagine what it's going to end up being used for, right? There's always going to be people that, that want to hurt people with things like that, but in some way. But in terms of practical uses, it's, it's like having an airbrush, but you can cut stone and metal with it, and it, it's non-thermal or, or relatively non-thermal, like it's not not having to produce these super high temperatures. And so we already know it does it because we already know it does it in the HHO. So like we need to try and create it where you're you're creating the same level of toroidal moment, but you aren't doing it with a lot of plasma involved yeah you're, you're doing it by just having enough ions moving at the right speed to create the toroidal moment to to break the crystal grain boundaries in or to break the ionic bonds okay non-thermally that's the target you want to go for so you can actually have a handheld device right maybe a little bit of insulation because and, and I, I don't know whether it needs to be over 100 degrees when you're using water because you're using water or whether you could have plasma on the air injection of high pressure you could have a plasma so and it, the plasma isn't to create temperature in the the air injection the plasma is to create ions uh, charge separation and then it goes into the auspicious structure or at least a, a three three level input um and you end up getting a sufficient toroidal moment to in the case of say uh, stone to be able to uh, uh, carve stone but without it ever being at, at high thermal temperatures yeah, so that that's that's kind of where i would want, want to get it if you want to hold your thinking uh, uh, i've just want to ask a question by fawn fogel he says to as someone who's new to this field uh, as a future undergrad uh, what should my focus be in this research um well uh I, I would suggest look for simple experiments that you can do that demonstrate the potential process. Um, I, I, I would, as I said to very senior scientists in this field, I would explore the simple experiments that were done by Takaki Matsumoto. Oh, sorry, but he's going to be able to see this on the uh, restream. So Fawn, when you see this on the restream, um, uh, and, and so I would look at that. The ultra experiment, of course, is very easy. I believe that we're going to be able to precisely describe the uh, lion experiment now from end to end. We have we have the full experimental apparatus he used, and we have some pre-prepared material and some uh, reactor uh, uh, um, sort of ingredients and stuff. So I think we might be able to replicate that. When that is fully described, that's a more complicated experiment than either two I've just previously mentioned. But, um, oh, all right. <laughs> Fawn, I've just been answering your question. Oh, he's come back again. All right. Fawn, I've just been answering your question. Sorry you missed it, but essentially I, I described a bunch of things that you could do, Fawn. Uh, um, the Takaki Matsumoto lead wire experiment, the ultra experiment, and the lion experiment will be much better described by the end of this year so that other people, and hopefully we will have properly replicated it as well. So um, I think you're going to be in a position to do experiments that no one's been able to do um, in in, with a set of a, a expectation that you're going to see a similar result at the end, which is something that be people have been after for a very long time in this field. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, is anyone else uh, want to step in and make commentary? Uh, and Alex, if you want to come in, if you've got other thoughts, then that would be appreciated too. You know, I, I just have a thought on the academic side. I, I don't know, Fawn, where you're, you know, what kind of program you're headed for. It's It's going to be a little difficult Maybe very difficult to actually find, um, you know, science um, courses that uh, that talk about this at all, right? You're just not going to get that. It's not the mainstream yet, uh, unless you go to a particular place. I mean, you think of what Hagelstein at MIT and maybe a couple other places academically, Texas Tech uh, for a while, University of Missouri for a while. I don't know what they're doing right now, University of Illinois for a while. And of course, University of Utah 34 years ago. <laughs> but you know, until, until I get that restarted, Utah is not not 
uh, hospitable. But uh, I, I, I can I don't even I can't even think of what science to tell. You know, I would I would do chemical physics, but I have other reasons for thinking that is interesting. So maybe a you know what we're seeing here is chemistry that um, behaves like it doesn't behave like chemistry, <laughs> right? But it, but it, it, you have to. I mean, Bob has. I mean, you have really absorbed an enormous amount of chemistry. Yeah. In your quest here. Yeah. Uh, you. I mean, it's astounding how much you have. So Fons said so he's based out of Minnesota, and I've been to University of Minnesota where they had the Sidney Kimmel Institute of Nuclear Renaissance, which was actually managed by the former Navy researcher uh, that I mentioned earlier. Um, and Dave Nagel? No, Dave Nagel? no, uh, Graham Hubler. He, uh, oh, yeah. He, he was managing the program there. And it's a shame that publicly there was not a lot made that, that was it was meant to become public and maybe it has but I, don't, I didn't see much come out there i'm not surprised he's saying that they didn't recognize the itons that were written about by matsumoto okay so uh, i think if the fact that you were able to talk about that probably means you know what an iton is for those that don't that are listening to this at a different time an iton is where an, an electron condensate structure has such an intense effect on a nucleon that it causes um, a, a proton to emit a positron and uh, and a neutrino, and that then the neutrino, the positron, and the electron uh, form an iton. It's bound together with the neutrino, and that is the iton. And then in the center, you get a neutron. So the, because you've got a positron and an electron, they cancel out their charges, and and so that is neutral. And the the nucleus is a neutron, so the whole structure is uh, uh, neutral, and so therefore it can go into other matter. But these things can form dense clusters of these things in this itonic cluster, and they form meshes and so forth. So that was his concept. Whether that is correct or not, the important thing is that he shared observations. And the observations are the same observations that we've replicated. And we actually replicated and published a lot of his observations before I even knew he existed, right? So it's kind of like verification without knowing that someone had done it before. Um, and so it was very rewarding to see that someone else. So whether the explanation is correct, actually, it, it, it doesn't matter. He's showing experiments that produce the effect, which is the effect that uh, is related to cold fusion. Okay. Now, it may in the fullness of time show that his understanding of what makes and constitutes ball lightning, because he did say that this is ball lightning, okay? If his concept of what ball lightning is actually how the coherent structure that forms this thing is made. Ken Shoulders never really said what's going on inside other than to say that it, describing an anapole without calling it an anapole. <laughs> his conclusion of his book, is the description, the modern description of an anapole uh, based on Zeldovich's 1956 description, but updated for modern thinking, okay? So uh, um, now would the, the description of the ball lightning of Matsumoto be consistent with the description of an anapole? I don't know whether it would. It's basically a neutral body. So I don't know whether that would be considered the same thing, does a neutron have a toroidal moment? Maybe. Does a cluster of neutrons have a tor toroidal no moment? Maybe. Could they have an anapole moment? I don't know. I've not really delved into that. But everyone seems to agree that it's ball lightning. And when you think it's ball lightning, they don't want you to talk about it in the West. <laughs> and yet, and yet, in the year 2000, <laughs> one Dr. Graham Hubler was asked by the BBC to comment on the great Abrahamson Dennis model of ball lightning that was conceived in Israel, where they said a lightning charge goes into the ground and it produces a plasma of silicon and carbon ions in a toroid that comes up as a toroidal structure, and that then the silicon and the carbon burn with oxygen in the air over a period of time, creating ball lightning. So the BBC went to Dr. Graham Hubler of the 
managing the, the the Navy research at that time. And and he was very, very interested. Of all the people on planet Earth they could have gone to to ask about ball, ball lightning in this 2000 news article, they chose Dr. Graham Hubbler at the US Navy. And then Dr. Graham Hubbler ended up managing the Sydney Kimmel Institute of Nuclear Renaissance. And then in the last ICCF 23 and ICCF 24 produced two limited hangout papers. In ICCF 23, he said exotic vacuum objects are nothing more than uh, columbic explosions. Yes, they produce columbic explosions, Dr. Graham Hubbler, but they're not nothing more than columbic explosions, <laughs> right? And then the, in, in ICSF 24, he published a thing, oh, this is nothing more than a shaped charge. Yes, a shaped charge, if you replace the copper with sand, produces ball lightning tracks going into metal. Uh, it, but it, it's, he said it, it, what it is, is you end up with a slug of metal that where the, it's traveling at a velocity that exceeds the plastic deformation uh, uh, um, of, of the metal and it punctures a hole through the metal. No, it's not. So they are complete limited hangout disinformation pieces by a guy that in 2000 was very, very, very interested at when he was uh, running the labs at the US Navy in ball lightning, right? It's ball lightning. You, you have to see what they don't want you to talk about to know that what it is, right? So it, it, Matt, uh, Matsumoto was able to publish right up to the point that he thought that it was ball lightning. And then they changed the rules so he couldn't publish. <laughs> and then the U.S. Air Force came. What are you in. talking about, Bob? Go on. I was in the Navy. I, I was a nuke. And in the submarine service, there's sea stories that go back from around the time in World War II from the old diesel electric boats. They regularly saw ball lightning and they would chase guys down the, the passageways. There's no way the Navy doesn't know about it. And I mean... In that time frame, I pulled the string on it. I won't talk about it. There's a lot of weirdness the Navy was up to there. And even people in the Navy don't know, but probably DOE and, the, and naval reactors, probably the Department of Energy is where all that went. But there's no way they don't know. I mean, they they have flying around submarines all the time. So there's uh, Andre Putrak, who actually brought over, uh, um, uh, what's his name, the spoon bending guy, to to work in in this uh, psychic spy program. Yuri Geller. Yuri Geller, yes. Um, Andrew Putrak talks about how in naval submarines, when they switched the electric uh, uh, capacitors on, they had things like spanners disappearing, like the whole spanner would disappear from our physical universe, right? <laughs> and this is the same effect as the geek disappearing, right? Um, but if you look at uh, you, I, I encourage everyone to look at the retrospective that I published by uh, um, uh, uh, Leonid Ritzke. Linnea Dritzkev was part of the team that developed a gamma camera, okay, when the Chernobyl accident happened, okay, and he talked about it, there's uh, never disclosed before images and, and, and uh, technical uh, photos of the, the, what they had to do. He had to develop the device that would be able to see gamma coming off cesium-137 to find where the, the core of the reactor was, okay, in Chernobyl. OK, they had to have this thing suspended from a helicopter 200 meters down when they found out the sh amount of shielding they needed. It, it was it was uh, uh, what was it? Uh, was it? Oh God, it was two tons. This camera, right? With the shielding. And they couldn't see anything. They couldn't see anything. The uranium had disappeared. It completely disappeared. And they dug under the reactor. There was no uranium there. But the bottom of the reactor wasn't broken. And what they found was, is that the, the, the carbon blocks had come out at totally, they're 40 centimeters or 50 centimeters long. It's very brittle. They're pure, pure carbon. And they've come out as whole blocks, yet they are inside the RBMK reactor and the lid is on top, but the lid must have lifted off. But where's, it was so freaky. There was bits of, and he says, there were bits of metal overlapping each other under the reactor. They were like overlapping mm. each other. Right. How does that happen? It's 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 like the effects. That you, so what happens in a nuclear reactor? So he says that. And, 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 and Shishkin talks about this. The gamma rays produce the monopoles. The monopoles can aggregate. They are what causes this whole process to occur. So the idea that you have ball lightning inside a nuclear submarine where you have a nuclear reactor that's producing gamma rays it's completely consistent with his theory behind how the Chobanovil accident, accident happened. And if you look at my commentary to him, I asked him, and I will do a blog on this next week. I asked him, have you, because 
they don't know where the uranium went. They don't know where uranium went, right? It, it wasn't sprayed out everywhere. The, the, there wasn't a thermal explosion. He said there were tanks in there that were covered with yellow and orange paint, and the paint wasn't burnt. It was just moved into a different place in the reactor. They had things shifted around in the reactor, like they teleported, right? And and um, so basically, so there was a, a cold thing that occurred, and he actually says it imploded. He, they think it imploded, right? And I actually think it did two things. It imploded, and then it kind of exploded exactly like these uh, um, EVOs do, these clusters. They, they implode, they go to super low temperature, and then they explode. And why do they explode? It's not a normal explosion. There's the coherent matter uh, uh, produces gases which have no electrons from a heavy element. And when they the coherent matter collapses, the bare nucleus collect electrons, and uh, that produces a massive drop in temperature, causing an implosion. But then they are uh, larger in atomic volume than the original heavy nuclei that were there, and that causes an expansion. So first it sucks in, and then it blows out. It's a suck and blow. And so um, my, my point being is that uh, um, uh, what you are describing with a ball lightning going down the, the, uh, uh, the submarine is perfectly possible when you've got a lot of gamma being produced at one end of the at one end of the the tin can basically and these things are partially reflected by metal parabolic structures which the tin can basically is because <laughs> that's what Parkamov was doing right so you're kind of going to get this from time to time in in one of those devices and then the, the other thing was I said could it have been that the uranium was in a coherent matter body and then when the it was all all of the energy was reorganized and uh it then when the music stopped and the coherent matter collapsed collapsed you had all kinds of other elements produced and he already pub he, he said yes that might be what happened something along those lines i'll, I'll do the the blogs with with my best translation but he says that he considers that that might be what happened because he already and the reason i said this is because in these pure, pure graphite blocks in an RBMK reactor, which are meant to be 100% pure graphite, he found transmutations of elements all through them. When they chopped up the blocks, there was transmuted lumps of transmuted met metals and, and quartz and you know silicon dioxide and, and calcium and stuff inside the, the things. But the, the, the mm. react this thing wasn't bro broken. So he says it, the the volume of the nuclei was smeared. He could, the, the phrase they kept using in the talk that you can go and watch and you can see the auto translation, it was somehow smeared within all of the material of the reactor. Well, wow. It didn't cool. penetrate in. It's like something was already in there in space time. And when it collapsed, it left these new elements formed that dropped out of the, 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 uh, the picture. I think the same thing happened at, at, at um, uh, but to a lesser degree, at um, uh, Fukushima, and there's that what they found is they found these blobs miles away from the reactor, and the the blobs look like things that we've seen in Lena, the the structure mm -hmm. of them. Uh, it's a fairly recent paper, and. <laughs> The guy from the U.S. Navy, the, the guy that works with the guy from the U.S. Navy asked me to write a paper with him on it. <laughs> and I was like, I'll get around to it at some point. But it's like the, everyone wants to know the answer to these questions. So uh, Fogel said, thank you for the info goes right now. I'm trying to find the right institution to apply to in order to contribute readily to this research. But how do I get the opportunity to do this research in an academic setting without being considered, considered a crackpot? Am I essentially stuck doing the research myself outside of academia until they take it more seriously? Honestly, Fawn, yes. Sorry, that's the reality. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I think we may be on the leading edge of that changing, frankly. You know, RPE was a step. Um, it would, it, you know, I, it was, I read that comment before you commented on it, Bob, and, um, one of the things, ICCF 25, we could ask the question of, of the people there at your institution, is that, you know, this accepted and publish that somehow. 
I mean, that, that, that's a great question for people who are interested, young people who are interested in this. And we need more of you, so I appreciate your interest, Vaughn. Um, but yeah, I'm afraid Bob is right at the moment. I think it may be changing. I, I don't think it should discourage you. You may have to just do it you know, on your own. And if you haven't discovered uh, canner-leonard.org run by Judd Rothwald, there's an enormous amount of material posted there, organized there. So you could keep, you know, doing your own studies and so forth. Um, and as we said but, earlier, it's it's now easier to query that system than anyone right. has ever had in the last thirty years. Right. Use, exactly. Using the, the 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 bot, the the uh, the GPT three point five bot. Right. And so 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 keep going, Juan. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I wasn't discouraged. It's been a hard slog, but there are great people in this community. Really fantastic people in this community. So people are going to have your back, and there there is. What, what's happening right now is we, we did some experiments in 2012, 2013 at the start of the MFMP. We replicated Francesco Cellani. This was presented to the EU. And over a period of time, this stimulated this uh, uh, desire to maybe fund Lena. And then other people, it came about that. And in fact, Cellani received some of this funding and it was put set out to two tranches of people. And I know for a fact that because EU started funding this, it encouraged the Americans to start considering funding it. Because I know it was after that, that I was approached by people that were influential. They asked me for X, Y, and Z. I gave it to them. And subsequent to that, this ARPA E funding came out. And so um, it's a kind of got a snowball effect. So you, I'm, a, I'm very happy to say, are in at the right time. I, you're in at the right time because there is the will, like like uh, Steve is saying, there is money on the table all across the world looking for real solutions. But you have to, we, 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 the whole point of the MFMP was to get people over the mental barrier, is this possible? We have experiments now that categorically show that this is impossible, that this is possible, and they are trivial to do, right? So we just need to get enough people to do them to, to, to break that barrier of, of, is it possible? Once it's possible, they have to be literally freaking insane to not try and pursue it. Because they're saying we want a solution and here's something that's possible that, that does magic that, allow, that allows so many potential outcomes that are positive. They have to do it. So you could be formed the guy that delivers this. You could be. You, you, you're in a beautiful time in history where... Uh, the hard work has been done over the last 120 years and you can put the cherry on top. You could be the guy in the right situation that says the right thing that makes this kickstart. So, you know, enjoy the opportunity that is, is with you. You've got a huge blue ocean of opportunity here where there's very few fish in that sea. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, but at the moment, there's a few places that are doing it. Europe seems better and private institutions seem better. If, if you have some experiments you want to pursue, then uh, we can maybe modestly help you. Uh, our stipulation is that you absolutely have to be open and honest about things that you're finding, whether they are positive or negative. You have to be showing exactly as you're seeing it. Uh, um, and, it and if that's the case, maybe we can help you get some basic equipment guide you on some basic experiments and even some uh, limited funding depending on which situation you're in america so we, we have a little bit more funding available uh, uh, to researchers that will work in that basis and only on that basis we, we're not you know at the end of the day people do walk away at some point uh, um if they if they think they've hit the jackpot and and you know the point is is also of the project to try and stimulate things to happen but we, we, we haven't got the kind of budgets that people, for instance, spend on, I don't know, a failed Texan gubernatorial Hot campaign. fusion. Hot fusion. <laughs> well, no, people spend $100 million on a political campaign and for a failed right. candidate. You know, it's, it's comical. And I don't even think that the MFMPs spent 300000 in in 11 years nearly. Dollars. <laughs> so it, it's comical. So... You're in at the right time, Fawn. It's fantastic. How old are you? Do you mind me asking? If you want to put that in the chat, if you if you don't want to, that to be public, but 
uh the, the 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 there is right now as i said in in the the first part of this talk there are people right now who are incredibly important characters in this field who have got cancer and they've not got long to live there are others that are frankly mature men they're in their 80s right quite a lot of the russians are in their late 70s 80s and, and you know this is they're, they're already living a good life uh, in terms of longevity and so you okay so no no no, no 30 you're probably the longest person in the field <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean okay so great um i recommend trying the ultra I, I you know it was discovered by using indium uh and uh we saw transmutation in the indium in the ultrasonic experiments we did in india and then when we did the control i had no idea that alan was going to use an ultrasonic cleaner to clean the indium foil I just wanted to look at the Indian foil as we'd bought it from the supplier to see if there was any contamination in there. But he put it in the ultrasonic cleaner and, and then he gave it to me. He said, I've cleaned this. I go, okay, all right. I didn't really want it clean, but anyway, thanks, Alan. <laughs> and, and so I put it under the, the SEM and there was these huge explosions, which were this same straight structure that we'd got in the plasma that produced the map of the pyramid, right? It was like, it's like the OM symbol, right? With the two things and the bit that comes down like this with the squiggle. Um, and there were synthesized elements in there. So then uh, um, aluminium and then the uh, Bin, Bin Juen Huang tried uh, copper at Taipei University. And so copper is actually quite a good one. It's in uh, Matsumoto's book because he says that copper, um, it cannot absorb hydrogen. And so when hydrogen is formed, it clusters on the surface of the copper, but the copper's got a plenty of electrons. So it's very good for the process. So that's why it was a preferred material to use for Matsumoto. So, and it's interesting to see that it worked. Okay, so- I believe, I believe Bob has a YouTube specifically addressing replicating the ultra experiment, correct? Yeah, yeah it's very so, simple. It's in 4K, it's only yeah. 20 minutes and it shows the whole process, including video and slow motion video of the, of yeah. the end result. So, but if you need any help with that, then- uh, um, you know, but it, it is really easy. My, my five-year-old could do it when she was, you know, that young. <laughs> the hard part is getting the SEM in your kitchen. There is that, <laughs> but I have thought, I have thought that if you can run enough material for long enough time, you can get some of these chemical reagent tests. And since that we see, we seem to see boron and we seem to see, say, calcium, and it does seem to produce silver and copper, but in very small quantities. You could start by doing a lot of ultrasonics with a lot of aluminium, right? And then use some of these silver iron tests or copper iron tests. Mm. Way to do it. Okay. Is there any necessary equipment or ways to track the data off back? Okay. Well, I think I've maybe answered that question in terms of you know we're becoming a really good friend of alan goldwater who does have an sem <laughs> not in his kitchen but at his house <laughs> so. so i mean he, here's the thing uh Vaughan, we, we can do uh, sem if you're going to be open about it uh, uh for basically at cost so uh with alan, alan goldwater because so it, he, he needs to maintain it it costs a uh, hundred dollars per um uh, tungsten electrode for the for the actual electron beam um so that there are costs involved but certainly you could we, we could give you time on the sem for about 300 dollars for a day rather than what you typically pay is 300 dollars plus tax for an hour <laughs> so um and maybe it, we could maybe fund that cost if you know what I mean, the project could fund the cost of you doing yeah. that, that testing. So, but again, if you're open and, and so forth, that has to be, you know, how, how we can't, we can't just give, give donors money away for, for people that just want to want to collect things for themselves. If you know what I mean? So Fawn, yeah, we can probably help with the SEM. So it'd be interesting if you do this separate experiment, um, we've seen the transmutation and the coherent matter effects using deionized water. 
um, because one of my concerns was if I'm seeing copper in there or I'm seeing boron in there, is this just contamination in the tap water? It could be, right? It could be calcium in the tap water, right? But if I start with deionization, deionized, deionized water, and I see synthesis in there, and I see, and it's interesting, I've got a whole series of experiments to show where I'm doing different times. And uh, um, you see when it starts off, it starts producing a little hole, and then you start seeing these squiggly blobs that start coming through the center of the vortices, and then they start twisting up, and then they start becoming more and more elements in there. It's uh, the, There is a huge opportunity for someone to do a large number of experiments where they're using deionized water, different lengths of exp experimental time, and different... I even ordered a whole bunch of ultra-pure aluminium 10 centimeter by 10, 10 centimeter samples. I don't know whether Alan received them, but that was for a whole series of experiments, but it's not been done yet. So like I say, even with the ultra experiment, there is a blue ocean of, of wins that you can get in this <laughs> um, right off the bat. So yeah. Any other questions? Hi, Chris. Are you joining us from where? Australia, are you? Has Chris joined us from Australia? I don't know. I'm going to have to drop off, Bob. Thanks for yeah, No worries, Steve. Thanks for your you contribution today. And good yeah. luck with your application there. Yeah, yeah, thanks. No worries. Okay, anyone else want to jump in? Alex, you sound like, you look like you're thinking. Is there anything you want to say? I don't know whether to bring it up. The, um, I, I, his name's escaping me now, Dr. Uh, Farrell. Have you looked at any of his stuff regarding uh, the pyramid? Refresh me. Joseph Farrell, uh, it's a book. It's called Giza Death Star. Oh, right. And okay, yes, thinks, yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, very parallel, coming from a completely different angle. So, you know, that's enough for me, given what we've seen. And uh, I, I think, you know, he thought that the the Grand Hall was also something like that and he also noticed that like something had been sabotaged or destroyed or removed. oh really okay all right yeah and so i mean and there's another engineer i forget his name but he mentions him because he thought it was a power plant um i'm somewhere in between i mean i i think it's possible i mean I, there's a lot of scary potential from this and which is why i think you know i'm with you on the meek aspect of it uh and, and it seems honestly the more i, I work I, on myself I'm the better the more this stuff comes potentially this has an incredible way of revolutionizing so many areas. But I think if you over abuse it, particularly in the weapons level, where you are destroying whole cities or whatever, you can you can end up where where you destabilize the Earth's magnetic field and you can or or it's locking to the 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 crust to the core and you end up with floods and and, and pole shifts and stuff like that. We're Atlantis sinking. I mean, that's what yeah. this is where this goes. And yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I, I, I've again with my background in the Navy and stuff. There's, there's definitely something going on down there in the Caribbean and, and Autech and all that. So, I, I'm agnostic. Well, I mean, we're about to find out a lot of stuff. <laughs> I mean, there's, it, it's, it, uh, yeah, it, it there can't is not a real come out moment now. in time here. There is a real moment yeah. in time. Um, the, the veil is definitely being lifted, <laughs> as it were. And my, my question is, is like, certainly the process seems to be able to desynthesize matter and synthesize matter. I do think part of that was probably to create Mukta, uh, uh, mana, uh, monoatomic material. I think that's part of the pyramid's purpose. But it clearly would have created a very, gen it would be far more intense overall than, say, a Windex but not as intense as, say, the destruction of tungsten on the HHO on tungsten. It's somewhere in between, but it will create. So we, we can have a glowing plasma ball in a Vega experiment sitting there all day and not doing anything, right? But under certain circumstances, driven to a certain level, particularly when you in, introduce hydrogen on certain materials, it can literally be driven to a point that it's there, it's there, it's there, and then it immediately cuts a hole in something, right? And and so, or it's on on the wire, and it's there. It's at the end. It's at the end. It's at the end, and then it goes round and it chews a bit, and then another one appears over here, and then it immediately cuts the wire. 
it's not doing anything and then it does 100% of a thing, but only on the on this boundary layer. So I think the pyramid would have glowed. It would have been like a frigging great light bulb. The, the whole pyramid, like in, in that spherical section. Uh, and I think that's why the Eye of Providence symbols have that circle with the light beams coming out of it. <laughs> One of his interesting theories, and I haven't thought about it deeply enough, but you might be intrigued, is that the top, which is missing, he says, was a fractal miniature version of the pyramid beneath it, including the, the guts and the cavities and all that. That's, that's an interesting entire, thought. That's I, don't, I, don't, I, don't see, I don't see where you need that. I but, don't know what the point would be. Yeah, I, I think he's, I think in that case, he's probably, you know, just hypothesizing and Based on a weapon, you know, it, uh, it, it, your it our, your analysis feels right to me. I mean, it, it, it fits too perfectly. But well, we'll literally. see in time. But the the fact that they choose calcium carbonate and they didn't use, you know, other element uh, elements in the in the pyramid's bulk of its construction, um, points to the fact that they understood, uh, you know, the the non spin nature of that material. I, I has have it been other... confirmed that that. That other chamber has it been confirmed that it's where we expect it to be, or we just kind of have rumors? So, of so that? actually, I need to do a little bit more detail on that. So initially, they thought it was either horizontal or, or a little bit tilted. If you actually look at the more recent things, they say it's the same length and the same volume. And the way there, I can see they're working that out is when you look at the lower levels. So, so here's the thing. And then this is absolutely freaky. The the grand gallery is the center of the grand gallery is seven meters to the east the center line okay the mm. sarcophagus is into the west with the edge of the the king's chamber basically as far as i can understand on the center line of the, the of the pyramid okay this is exactly as these discs arrange themselves okay one one is in front of the other one okay like that. So like, like so like we, we th these are our, my two circles. Like uh, I'll do it like this. <laughs> I'll get out my props. <laughs> so we got our we got our two circles like this, right? And they're overlaid. And the, sorry, this way. The one going to the north is overlaid and it, it goes towards the east. The, this is going towards the east, and this one goes toward towards the west. Okay. This is the north, this is the south, okay, in the pyramid. And so it's not surprising that the Grand Gallery now. I don't think the other one is so important as the one at the bottom, because it, it, this is where the hydrogen, in my view, is coming up, and that's where it gets properly ionized. If you look at the muon scans, when you are looking at the, the scans that are looking at the lower level, they are almost exactly in the center line. But when you look at the scan that's as they progressively go up, they get further out. And so when you do it in your head, it looks like it's a mirror image of the grand gallery above. So as the grand gallery is, is, is going up like that, the other side is like that, which is exactly what it should be. So the, the, the muon images that they have got right now are pointing to it being exactly kind of like, a, in my view, are pointing to a mirror image of, of the, the one below. Hey, Chris, how you doing? Good, good. Sorry, I just want to do... Um chime in just to because i i think that's awesome but the north south orientation like it it might be the magnetic field influencing that but it might actually be the relic neutrino flux influencing that being which like is, a process, which like, is in in a way caused by the north south it is yeah well yeah it links in but it's that would be an east west flow so you know, right I guess, okay yeah yeah but no, but that's that's what comes out of, of the actual toroidal moment rather than the because it's fractal. So like the the the, the end moment might be going east west, mm. right? But but yeah, if if you've got the, the torus like that, then you have a sub torus like that, and then that's made of torus that are like that, and those yeah. ones. So like if it's only a um anyway, the, the point is I I think they do arrange themselves north south they're certainly influenced by magnetic field 
And because we know this from Arodskiev's work, we know this from the uh, Bogdanovich work. So 100% they're inf influenced by a north-south magnetic flux lines. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the way I've been viewing it recently is that this is like a big windmill, but running off relics, which... Um... Oh, I know. Okay, I see where you're going with that. Yeah, and, and maybe, and maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I mean, my, my view on it, and, and until I see uh, convincing arguments is apparently there's a ring of pyramidal type structures around the earth. And uh, the two beams that come out either way, I believe are, are connecting up to those other pyramids. And I don't necessarily believe the other pyramids need to have the machinery, when I say machinery, the configuration of the internals with the 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 uh, radiation emitters and stuff to be able to um, uh, generate the energy flux. I believe that if they just literally made of a non-spin matter pyramid, they will actually be able to capture and it will just generate it will just generate the spin matter in there. It'll it'll just be yeah. a um, yeah, like it's all it coupled. Might, yeah, or it might be a resonator that enhances the overall energy field. Yeah, and by doing that, it, it actually focuses it through the, like into the, um, or through those toroids as well. Kind right, of like yes, yes, that, yes, yes, that yes. focusing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 because it clear, clearly, at least on the electromagnetic level, the Russians showed that it, it, it does focusing of um, waves in the sort of, uh, or whatever it was, it was, it was the same frequency that was being used by Parr or something like that in one of his experiments um yeah so what 1.45 gigahertz or something like, i don't know what it was it was anyway it, it's in the par work and it's it, it, yeah. it lines up with what the russians found was uh the ideal resonance so yeah. yeah so we've got don versus eden saying thank you um can it be east west rubbing on north south creating a vortex with 90 degree angle um don do you want to step in and explain your point there sorry i didn't quite immediately get it don do you uh do you want to speak okay so maybe someone else can interpret what's don saying there don and uh don vierden is saying can it be east west rubbing on north south creating vortex with 90 degree angle uh yeah so what i'm what i'm saying is um with regard to that um if you can imagine the 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 n minus one tor has uh, the beam coming out of it it's actually <laughs> It's like that. You have a beam coming one way. Sorry, it's like that actually. Uh, so you have a beam coming out one and one way and one the other like that. Okay. So, so this would be north, and it's uh, seven meters centered to the to the east. This is the south, and is uh, the you know sarcophagus is to the to the west, and the center of the vortices, uh, toroidal moment. One one beams out to the west and the other one beams out to the east and that they go round the planet yeah okay so all right east west flow drives the yeah okay so yeah so if you can imagine you have this structure um and the planet is rotating like this <laughs> um or whatever um the, the, i think this is what chris was suggesting that maybe uh it's acting a bit like a windmill um uh, <laughs> and here's a super crazy idea maybe maybe the pyramid was built to get the earth spinning <laughs> i don't know <laughs> that's a super crazy idea <laughs> Okay, does anyone else have anything to add? Ask any questions about ego out? 
about what Stephen discussed. Okay, well, um, if no one wants to chime in, and if you do want to chime in, you can hit reactions and go raised hand. But if you don't, I'm going to call it a night because it is half past midnight here. And I thank you for joining me on this Zoom call. I don't really care. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate it very much. Yes, and I'll well. uh, report once I get the grill thing going probably in the next few weeks. Awesome. Well, I'm really looking forward to it. Thanks, Don. Great question. Thanks, Chris, for chiming in, and that was good too. So, David, what's on? Do you have anything to say? Sign out? Yes, no? Okay. All right. So, thanks, guys. I will see you in the next stream. Uh, good night for now. Good night. Buenas noches.